Good evening and welcome to This Is Jesus for our final talk. This week has been a week of opportunity for students across Oxford to encounter the real Jesus. We've been delighted to be joined by Dr. Tim Keller, and he's speaking this evening too. I'm going to hand straight over to him. He'll speak for around 30 minutes, after which time there'll be an opportunity for questions. You can text in your questions, and the number will be behind on the screen. After we've dealt with a few questions, there'll be about a little bit of time when Tim will just give a short conclusion, um, and then we'll be out of here by about 9.15. So Tim, straight over to you. Straight into the tomb. 
He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Let's stop right there. That's the first part of the story. I said, what we're going to learn from this passage is that faith is impossible, Christian faith is impossible, and it's rational. Now, when I say Christian faith is impossible, I'm trying to get your attention. It's a wee bit of an overstatement, but not too much. I'm not saying it's impossible to have Christian faith. What I am saying is that it is impossible for you or me to produce it without outside intervention and help. Now, the way that comes across, and I mentioned this if any of you were... Uh, here today uh, at the lunch hour, uh, notice that Mary Magdalene alone, Peter and John, the disciple that Jesus loved, we understand is John, the author of the book. Peter and John, no other disciples are there, you know, the apostles, the twelve apostles. Here's Mary coming to the tomb on the uh, third day after Jesus is dead. And what happens? She sees the tomb, uh, the, 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 uh, the stone is rolled away, and she immediately said, runs back and says, they've taken the body. Now, as I said this afternoon, Jesus Christ has been saying to his disciples over and over and over again, I'm going to die and rise again on the third day. It's actually, uh, uh, especially in, say, the Gospel of Mark and some of the other Gospels, it's very obvious, Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, he says, I'm going to die and rise again. Mark chapter 9, he says, I'm going to die and rise again. Mark chapter 10, he says, I'm going to die and rise again. I'll a few more details each time. Uh, trying to get it across to the disciples. He had said it so often that the enemies of Christianity had put a guards at the tomb. That comes out in the book of, of Matthew. So why in the world? When Mary actually saw that the stone rolled away, and she must have had must have remembered that Jesus said, on the third day I'm going to rise from the dead. Why in the world didn't she look and say, could be, maybe, she didn't even think about it. It didn't even occur to her. She runs back, they stole it. Now, for a minute, I'm going to lay aside why first century Jews would have been that absolutely convinced that a resurrection that Jesus could not rise from the dead. I'm going to go to, I'm going to try to go back to the historic context and just say, why would, why would it be that first century Jews couldn't believe such a thing? But for a moment, I'd like to pull back and just make the larger point that I think this narrative makes, and that is, nobody, naturally, nobody, naturally, can believe. There is an allergy to belief in God in us, or as some theologians say, an inability. And some of you know that there's different theological traditions inside Christianity that have somewhat different views on to what degree we have an ability to, uh, to respond to God. And, uh, but, but all of them agree that we actually can't just produce faith without help from outside. Do you hear that? Do you understand the, that allergy, that inability? Now let's, let's, let's come up to today for a moment. Like I said, I'm looking at the bigger point. Not For a minute, I'll get back to what Mary's problem was. Thomas Nagel, very, very prominent philosopher, American philosopher at NYU, in my hometown, New York University. He wrote a book some years uh, ago called The Last Word. It was a book on epistemology. But there's this fascinating section in the book. He is an atheist. He is a secular atheist, as he says. But then here's what he says. Belief in God makes people nervous. It is the fear of religion. In speaking of the fear of religion, I don't mean to refer to the entirely reasonable hostility toward established religions and religious institutions in virtue of their objectionable moral doctrines, social policies, and political influence. In other words, he says, we have every right to hate the church, which is what he's saying. <laughs> but then he says, I am talking instead about something much deeper in us, the fear of religion itself. I speak from experience being strongly subject to this fear myself. Listen, I want atheism to be true. 
And I am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God, and naturally I hope that my belief is right. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. This cosmic authority problem that I have is not rare. I am curious, but I doubt, that there is anyone who is genuinely indifferent as to whether there's a God. Now, everybody knows, and, and, and people often point out, that there are emotional and psychological reasons why you might want to believe in God. But very seldom do people point out, and I think Thomas Nog was saying so, and I'm trying to push, push this home, that there are enormous emotional and psychological reasons that we all have to not believe in God at all. Why? Do you really think you're objective? In looking at a book like the Bible, or looking at a message like the Gospel, that if it's true, you would lose control of how you live your life? Are you telling me you're objective about that? See, that's what he's saying. He said, how in the world can you say, oh, I'm an, I, I'm a, that word, he used the word indifferent, but he, what he means is, if, when people say, I'm completely objective, I'm looking at the evidence, I just don't see enough evidence, surely you know that you have a deep layer of prejudice there, and if you won't acknowledge it, you're never going to get close to objectivity. Never. If you have, we, you certainly would be the same in jurisprudence. I know there's jurisprudence in America and Britain aren't quite the same. Uh, certainly I know this in America. If, let's just say, you're a judge, and suddenly a case comes before you uh, concerning a company, and you own stock in that company, so uh, the decision will have a huge impact on the price, the, the value of that stock. Would you be allowed, or would you allow yourself, to sit in judgment? No, why? Because you couldn't possibly be objective. When you know that if the decision goes this way, you're going to lose all your money. So you, we say, you recuse yourself, right? Here's the problem. We're all in that, sa that same boat. We're all in that same seat. When you come to Christianity to decide, is it right or wrong, you have a vested interest in it being wrong. But you can't recuse yourself, because you've got to look at the evidence. And therefore, here's what I suggest, three things. Mary only believes because of help from the outside. John and Peter, they only believe because of help from the outside. They do not have the ability to believe. So here's what I would suggest. First of all, please doubt your doubts. Please look at your doubts and realize you do have a certain amount of emotional and psychological force underneath them. You're afraid of it being true. It's got to be. You know that. I hope you know that. You'll never be, how do I say, you'll never be fair-minded with the evidence if you don't see that, number one. Number two, some of you may be overconfident that you are objective, and yet somehow the evidence just isn't enough for you. Why don't you consider praying? Why don't you consider saying, Lord, I, God, I don't know if you're there, but if you are there, please help me think this through. Break the ice. If you're not willing to do that, you're not willing to see your prejudice. Say, look, I don't even know if you're there, but I do know I'm prejudiced, and therefore, if you are there and I'm prejudiced, please help me get through it. But a lot of you, here's the last thing I'll say under this heading. A lot of you are actually too anxious. The Bible says that you can't believe without help from the outside without God helping you, without Jesus coming to you and speaking to you like he speaks to Mary in all of her, uh, we're going to get to that in a second, in all of her consternation, she's running around and she doesn't see Jesus. Uh, just please keep this in mind. If you want to believe, if you find yourself desiring to believe, if you find yourself very interested in Christianity, but you're afraid somehow you're not going to be able to come into faith, I've talked to several of you, at least five of you, who seem to say, to have said to me this week, I'm interested and I'm, I'm motivated, I'm very interested, but I'm really afraid I'm not going to get it right, or I'm afraid my motives aren't right, or I'm not sure I'm going to have enough faith. Hear me. A sense of Christ's absence may be a sign of his presence. Because, you see, I don't think you're capable of wanting to believe without him giving you some help. And so if you want to believe, instead of being afraid that he's not around, look at that as a sign that actually he may be right there at your elbow, just like with Mary, as we're going to see. Mary's in tears. Mary, she, he, Jesus is talking to her, and she doesn't even realize, as we're going to see, that he's talking to her. You might be in that situation right now. 
you might feel like everything's falling apart and I kind of want something, but I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to make it. A sense of his absence might be a sign of his presence that he's working already in your life. So faith all by yourself is impossible, but obviously not impossible to have, just impossible to develop or produce yourself. Point one. Point two. The other thing we see in this part of the passage is that faith is rational. Now, what I mean by rational is there's evidence. Let's take a look again now at, at why uh, Mary and John and Peter aren't there. Uh, wait, if, you, if you don't know anything about first century culture, first century history, um, it doesn't make much sense that Jesus would have said over and over and over again, you, I'm going to rise on the third day. And when you get to the third day, the disciples are not there waiting to see. And even when Mary Magdalene sees, she runs away assured that it, there's, there's been no resurrection. The reason why this is actually credible, actually it's kind of incredible to us when you read it not knowing anything about the past. But if you read a book like I did, <clears throat> N.T. Wright, The Resurrection of the Son of God, written some ten years ago, a big thick book giving you the exhaustive uh, account of the historic evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The best book written on the resurrection in at least a hundred years. Um, you'll know that first and Greeks and Romans would never believe that an individual could be resurrected from the dead. Greeks and Romans, of course, Greeks believed the body was bad. Uh, so the idea of uh, the resurrection of the body, who wants that? The whole idea behind salvation is liberation from the body. The Jews didn't have that view of the body, but the Jew, some of the Jews, like the Sadducees, didn't believe in any resurrection. And the Pharisees and some others believed in a resurrection at the end of time, a general resurrection of the righteous. Nobody believed somebody could rise from the dead here. And certainly nobody believed, as we said a couple nights ago, the Jews were the last people in the world to believe that a human being could be the Son of God. They had been taught all their lives that God cannot be human. They had this transcendent view of God. If you put all that together, you'll see why first century Jews were every bit as close to the idea of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as you are for different reasons. The average person here today in Oxford has, thinks the idea of a resurrection of Jesus Christ, a bodily physical resurrection, is crazy. Why? Because of the, your post-enlightenment naturalism, your idea that there aren't such things as miracles, that everything has a scientific explanation and so on. So we're close to it. But they were close to it. They were every bit as close to the idea of the resurrection. That, that, this shows you. Every bit as close to the, to the resurrection, the idea of an individual rising from the dead, as you, for different reasons. Now, if that's true, and it is, imagine what evidence you would have to get in order to absolutely believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Physical resurrection. Okay? Would you all do that for me? Just right now, class? Make believe I'm your professor and you really need to listen to me? Okay. What kind of evidence would you have to have to break through your absolute ironclad doubts? Your, you have these beliefs, this worldview that insists that couldn't have happened. What kind of evidence would have had to happen to you, would have to happen to you? if it was supposed to shatter and you would believe Jesus Christ the Son of God and resurrect from the dead. Whatever that evidence is that you can imagine now, they must have had something like it. You see? They must have gotten the same kind of evidence. Because they were as close to it as you were. And if that's the case, that evidence might be enough for you. What's the evidence? Well, uh, it, 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 if you take a look at some of these books that marshal all the evidence, including that book, and I'll just, here's a little personal note, I'm being personal tonight. Uh, I had thyroid cancer about 10 years ago. And, uh, uh, and I'm fine now. However, if any of you have had cancer, <clears throat> it's an awfully young crowd, so my guess is not many of you had. Uh, even when they say you'll probably recover, I have to say, once they tell you you have cancer, it focuses the mind wonderfully on life and the meaning of life, etc. I'm a minister, sure, but to be told you might die, uh, it focuses the mind wonderfully. And I had, uh, uh, in recovering from the cancer, 
uh, I had a, a, a month in which I couldn't do anything. I couldn't go anywhere. I was actually under quarantine in some ways because all the radioactive iodine in myself. So I had nothing to do for the, for the first time in 30 years and probably the last time in my life. <laughs> and I will prop, so I sat down and read through N.T. Wright's 890 page book, including all the footnotes. I read all the footnotes too. <laughs> and it was astonishing. I mean, uh, over the years, here's the problem. You, you must be careful not to just read one account of the evidence for the resurrection and say, ah, that wasn't enough. I dare you to try 890 pages of it. Uh, or at least something more substantial. We put some of it, some of it's in the book, Reason for God, that you can get here. But I mean, let me give you one little piece of evidence. It's right here. Who is this, who is this eyewitness? John, the Gospel writer, tells us that an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ was Mary Magdalene, a woman. And what all commentators will tell you, what all historians will tell you is this. In those patriarchal times, women were not trusted, and therefore women could not give testimony, either in Jewish courts or in Roman courts. Their testimony was considered unreliable because of the, because of the patronizing prejudice against them. Their, their, their testimony was not admissible in court. And therefore, if you were making up an account of the resurrection, if you were writing it up, trying to, trying to get fans, trying to get recruits, you would never in a million years make a woman the first witness. And yet, actually, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the very first eyewitnesses of the resurrection are all women. And the, the only historically plausible answer to why women are in the account, the only reason why the men who wrote these accounts would put women in, when their testimony would not be plausible in that time and place to the average reader. The only reason they put it in there was because it must have happened. She must have been there. She must have seen, she, she, she must have claimed, those women must have claimed to have seen Jesus Christ. So there's a lot of evidence for the resurrection. Actually, you can even see it here if you look carefully in the text when, uh, what, what Peter does. You notice it says that Peter comes along behind and goes straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was lying still in its place, separate from the linen. The word saw is actually the Greek word theoreo, which, as you know, means not just to see, but to think and process. He, looked, he comes in and he's probably thinking something like this. I'm not saying this is all the resurrection evidence there is. He walks in and he says, wait, here's... This body had been wrapped in cloth, and, there, and the cloth is still laying there. And where the, uh, the, the, the piece of cloth that was over the head, over the face, is laying in its place, still in its place. So there it is. And he's sitting there thinking, wait a minute. If Jesus had revived and gotten up, the, 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 the grave clothes wouldn't be there. They'd be all torn. But if friends had taken the body, why in the world would they have dishonored the body by taking away a naked body? They would have kept it in the grave clothes. But if enemies were doing it, why in the world would they have taken it off and put it there nice and neat? And he's thinking, and he's thinking, and he's thinking. What is he thinking? Uh-oh. See, now, faith is not only rational. You can never get all the way into faith through reasoning. But faith is not less than rational. Because the faith is an act of a whole person, and therefore you've got, you've got to have a convinced mind. You obviously cannot get all the way to faith, because faith, reason is not the same as faith. Obviously, faith goes beyond reason, but it's not less than reason. We live in a time in which people say over and over again, there's really no objective truth. If you want to believe in Christianity, if you want to believe whatever faith you want, if it's relevant for you, if, if, it, if, it, if it's satisfying to you, don't worry about whether or not you know, it actually happened. If it's relevant for you, you can believe it. You know, Hitler believed something that was relevant for him. And we all think he was wrong. Why? Because we actually all do know <coughs> down deep there is such a thing as truth. And there is such a thing as a standard. Christianity will never say, believe me only because it's relevant. Christianity basically says, don't believe Christianity because it's exciting and practical and relevant. Believe it because it's true. Because if it's not true, it won't be practical and relevant. 
You're never going to be able to face the suffering that's ahead of you, oh young people, if you don't, in the end, believe Christianity is not just relevant and exciting, which it is, but it's true. Now let's read the second half. So Christianity is impossible. You need help. Christianity is rational, but we go beyond that, of course. Let's read the last part, where it says, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking it was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Okay, let's move on to point three. I say, and this is in some ways the most important point, Christian faith is graceful. And by the way, I'm using two L's. It's graceful with two L's. Here's the point that is all through the rest of the New Testament, but we're seeing it in narrative form here. Before I show you it in narrative form, let me tell you what the point is. At the very essence of what it means to not just have faith in general, but life-transforming, Jesus-encountering, saving faith in particular, is when you learn the difference between salvation by grace through what Jesus Christ has done, rather than salvation by working very, very hard and all your moral efforts to earn your place with God. Those are two absolutely different paradigms. They're actually two different faiths. Put it like this. Traditional religion says, I obey God, therefore I get accepted and blessed and saved. I obey God, therefore I'm accepted. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is, I'm accepted by God through what Jesus Christ on the cross has done for me, therefore I obey. I obey, therefore I'm accepted. Or the paradigm is I'm accepted, therefore I obey. Now, two people, one operating out of I obey, therefore I'm accepted, one operating out of the uh, paradigm I'm accepted because of what Jesus Christ has done, therefore I obey. Therefore I please the God who's done this for me. Two people could be sitting right here, and both of them spending... A lot of time helping the poor, uh, working very hard to tell the truth, working very hard in general, industry, integrity, charity. They can be living the same kind of lifestyles, as it were, externally, but for completely two different motivations and in two different spirits. If I'm obeying, hoping that somehow eventually God will bless me and take my, uh, get my prayers, answer my prayers and take me to heaven or something like that, if, if I'm obeying in order to be accepted, I'm always, I'm always afraid. I'm always insecure. I'm actually operating out of fear. I'm doing it hoping. And of course, if I feel that I am doing it, I'm living like I should, your identity rests not in God, it rests in yourself. It rests in your own abilities. And listen, friends, if you, if you get your identity out of being a hardworking person, if that's your identity, I'm a hardworking person. That's who I am. You will have to look down your nose at people. You have to look down on people who you think are lazy. If you get your identity out of being a moral person, a good person who obeys the moral law, you will have to look down your nose. If that's your identity, you'll have to look down your nose and look down at people who are, uh, you think, immoral. But if you obey because you're already accepted, you're doing all the things you're doing out of joy. You're doing all the things you're doing out of gratitude. And you're humbled because you know that even though God loves you, He loves you uh, freely. It's not something you earn. 
so you look at people who are not living like they should, you cannot feel superior to them. So here you have two, two people, one trusting in their moral efforts, one trusting in Jesus' efforts. And even though on the surface they might look like they're living the very same kind of lives, in the end it produces two completely different kinds of character. And it also has completely different, you have self-righteousness and bigotry versus humility and graciousness. It, complete, it, it, it affects people around you in such totally different ways. And the very essence of becoming a Christian is to transfer the trust you have in your own abilities and your own efforts onto what Jesus Christ has done. Now, how does that get across in this narrative? Right here. You see what happens? Mary goes to the tomb. She looks around. She finally sees Jesus. She says, teacher, Mary, he says. At that moment, especially when he sends her to go tell the world what's happened, in some sense, she's the first Christian. Do you know why she's the first Christian? What's a Christian? A Christian is someone who knows Jesus is risen from the dead, believes that, uh, has had an encounter with the risen Christ. For one moment, in a sense, she's the first Christian who's going to the world to tell him. Do you know what he's done? Who is Mary Magdalene? We don't know much about her. We do know she had been a demon-possessed person. And demons were cast out. But Jesus Christ chose a woman, not a man. Chose a reformed mental patient, not a pillar of the community. Chose a lay person, not one of the apostles, not one of the officers. What's he doing? How much clearer can he be to say, my salvation is not based on breathing, it's not based on pedigree, it's not based on moral attainments. I am not really your teacher, I'm your savior. I've come not to call the strong, but to call those who know they're weak. I'm here to save you, not by your work, but by my work. And the minute you understand that, the penny drops, as it were. And the change happens. Martin Luther talks about it like this. Martin Luther talks about his experience of conversion. He was a monk. He was a teacher of scripture, by the way, in seminary, as it were, theological college. And yet, this is what happened. He said, I labored diligently and anxiously as to how to understand Paul's word in Romans 1.17, where he says that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. I thought Paul was saying that the righteousness whereby God punishes the unrighteous, and therefore I had no confidence that my merit would assuage him. Then I grasped that the righteousness of God that Paul is talking about is that righteousness which through grace and sheer mercy God gives to us by faith. God gives me Jesus' record. See? And the minute he understood that it's not a record I give God and then he saves me, but it's a record God gives me and then I'm accepted and saved. He says, the minute I understood that, thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through the open doors into paradise. When I saw the difference that law is one thing and grace and gospel is another, I broke through. Okay, lastly. No, there's two more, but they're pretty brief. Existential. Faith is not only graceful, it's about grace, it's about grasping grace, it's existential. What do I mean by that? You know, that it's a very confusing place where she, he, Jesus says, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Do not hold on to me, I have not ascended to the Father. What's confusing is, when he meets Thomas, he lets Thomas touch him. In fact, when he meets the women at the, uh, at the end of the book of Matthew, he lets, they, they take hold of his feet. So some people think what Jesus is saying is, oh, I'm too holy, I'm like the burning bush, don't touch me, or you go, Pfft. But he's clearly not saying that. Because it looks like, in fact, the Greek word there means, you're grabbing me very tightly, don't hold me so tightly, he says. And then he says, I'm ascending. And here's what many commentators say, and I think they're right. Mary was grabbing hold of him, because Mary's a lover. And she was grabbing hold of him, and probably maybe squeezing him, and saying, I'm never going to let you go again. I'm never going to lose you again. And you know what Jesus is saying? Mary, when I ascend to the right hand of the Father, and I send the Holy Spirit, which is my spirit, into your life, you won't leave me. I mean, you, you don't need to hold on to me this way. You will have me every bit as much as you have me now if you let me go to my Father. 
Faith connects you to Jesus existentially. Faith is not just rational, oh, okay, I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, I, therefore it must be true, so okay, I sign on the, the, the dotted line. Faith is a personal commitment to him. But then on the other hand, it's a personal reception of him. He comes. He comes near. It's existential. And lastly, it's individual. And the reason that's really short is this. John gets it right away. Peter goes home and thinks about it. Mary runs around until she actually lays her hand on him. They all had different trajectories, different paths. You've got to be very careful not to look at some other Christian and say, well, that person had a dramatic experience. That person came along slowly. Don't compare yourself to other Christians. There's a whole lot of different ways. You have to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. You have to admit that you're a sinner. You have to believe that he died in your place. You have to commit yourself to him. But there's so many ways in. Uh, don't compare yourself to other people. Faith is impossible on your own. It's rational. And yet, it's existential and it's personal. It's filled with grace. It's all about grace. And it's somewhat individualistic. Now, what we're going to do at this point, I have one more thing to tell you about the text, but I'll come back after. We're going to hear a first-person account. And we're going to also, during that time, you're going to be texting questions into uh, uh, me, and we're going to do question and answer. After that time, I'll have an epilogue. But anyway, Rob's going to tell you that anyway, right? Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, we'd love to give you now the opportunity to text in any questions that you might have for Tim. And the way to do that, just to text into that number, and they'll come up on the screen. But in the three or four minutes while we just do that, I'd love to invite Emma onto the stage. Over these last few nights, we've been hearing stories of students in Oxford who have encountered Jesus. And Emma's going to tell us a little bit about that in her life right now. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm a second year medic up at LMH. A year ago, I was sitting where you are now, listening to people who seem sincere, but just a little bit crazy. I didn't understand what they meant when they said, God changed my life, or the Holy Spirit moved me, and I certainly didn't see how it applied to me. Let me take you back to the beginning of my story. I'm from a non-Christian family, and I grew up thinking that believing in anything apart from what we can see and prove was stupid and naive. I didn't want to open up to the possibility that there might be more to life, and I got fixated on all the controversies surrounding the church, so I never really bothered to find out what it was all about. And then I came to Oxford, with no interest or expectation of finding faith of any kind. But in Freshers' Week, I made friends with two Christian guys. They seemed like rational people, but when they started talking about Jesus and why he'd died to save us, it began to sound a bit weird. Despite that, I couldn't help but be curious about them and their beliefs, so after many hours of asking them questions, I agreed to go to church with them. The first time I went, I sat feeling uncomfortable and disagreed with almost everything that they said. But I went back the next Sunday, and without really knowing why, I turned up every week after that, and gradually I began to think, what if? I didn't understand properly or believe any of it, but I did start thinking, what if this is true? What if Jesus did die for me? What would that mean for my life? An amazingly short time later, I reached the point I mentioned earlier, where I was sitting in this room listening to a talk, and something unexpected happened. I had heard a lot about who Jesus really was, and it was beginning to make a lot of sense to me. I'd seen my Christian friends actually living, uh, uh, actually, uh, actually acting on what they'd been telling me, and something about their lives seemed different from mine because of it. I was pretty much convinced that all of this was true, but I still wasn't willing to commit myself and believe it, just in case I was wrong. And to be honest, I didn't know how to go from understanding what Jesus did for us on the cross to trusting in him personally. But that evening, I realised all I had to do was ask. To ignore my fear of being wrong and ask God for help. As soon as I did that, something changed, and I found that I was able to put my trust in God. I'm not trying to make living for Jesus sound simple or easy, because it's not. But if you're open and willing, then the initial step to opening up to him is much easier than you might think. And what comes when you do is truly amazing. A personal relationship with God is difficult to describe but that's because he's unlike anyone else you've ever met. So it kind of makes sense that he's a little hard to put into words. My relationship with God means that I know that there's an all-powerful being who cares for me personally, who's willing to listen to every petty gripe I have with the world, 
and who will wait patiently for me when I forget him, no matter how many times I'm tempted to turn and run away from him. And that's why I'm standing here. My hope is that some of you will understand what I and all the other Christians here tonight are saying to you. That God loves you, and if you let him, he will change your life, just like he's changed mine. Thanks very much, Emma. We're going to dive straight into the questions, so... Great. Many people believe in God because they find the evidence compelling. However, many other religions have compelling evidence. Is it impossible to look through all the evidence and see which is the most compelling? So how can we be certain about God? Uh, well, don't forget, this almost assumes that the claims of the different religions are the same. So, for example, if, if the claim of Islam for Muhammad is he was a prophet, a divine prophet, um, you could look at all the evidence and you could conclude that he was. If you look at the, uh, the claims of Jesus, of course, the claims of Christianity are, uh, for Jesus are far higher. So, if the, I guess I would say... If, if all the evidence for the claims of the other religions you find compelling, but you also find all the evidence for the claims of Christianity compelling, you become a Christian. Because the claims are so much more, how do I say it, audacious and higher. As we've said all along, the other religions say, uh, we have a sage and a prophet who, will sh who, who has revealed the way to find the divine. And Christianity says, no, this is the divine who has come down in the form of a human being who has come to save you. Not, here's how to be saved, he's come to save you. It's just so absolutely different that if, the, if you find the evidence for Christianity compelling and the evidence of the other religions compelling, you would become a Christian, I think. I disagree with many things yeah. Paul says. Would you say it is acceptable to subscribe to what Christ himself says, but disagree with the elements of Christianity which seem to be due to social or human sources? Well, um, it's, it's, it's acceptable. I would say, if you change, I would say it's inconsistent to subscribe to what Christ himself says and disagree with the other parts of the New Testament that you disagree with. I would say it's inconsistent, but... Uh, the, reason why I'm modif the reason why I'm not being too hard on you is this. I want you to go to Christ first. There's no doubt about it. it, it that is to say, if, if over here, in this part of the New Testament, there's some teaching about gender, for example, or sex, um, that you're unhappy with. Uh, but the, the core of Christianity, notice I, I haven't talked about sex or gender during this entire week, if you've been here, except when you ask me a question about it. Now, the reason is not because it's not an important part of life, but because it's not, it's not the core of what Christianity teaches. Uh, as I think I may have said a couple other times, if Jesus Christ is the Son of God from heaven, who died for us and was raised from the dead physically, if that's true, then you're going to have to figure out a way of dealing with other parts of the, of the Bible. If you think you can live, and I know people have, accepted Christ and still just not been able to accept other parts of the New Testament. I, I think that's inconsistent, but it doesn't mean you, you, you went in the right direction. You went to Christ. That's the place to start. However, um, I think in the end, you're going to find that Jesus' view of Scripture and uh, what it means to be, uh, you know, what his understanding of Scripture is, will eventually lead you to say, I don't like some of the things in the rest of the New Testament, but I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to come to grips with it. I'm going to have to come to terms with it. So, I, in some ways, I'm, I'm partly affirming this and saying, please don't start in those other places. Yes, go to Christ, figure out whether the core things the Bible says about Christ are true or not. But, uh, to say it negatively, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, who cares what the rest of the New Testament says? You know, so who cares what it says about sex and gender? If, on the other hand, he is who the, he says he is, and he is the Son of God, then you will have to go out and find out what else uh, the, the New Testament says. So, start with Christ, but in the end, I think it would be inconsistent not to uh, accept the rest of the New Testament. Thanks. The Bible tells us that heaven is perfect. However, some of my friends and family are atheists. How can heaven be perfect 
if it is eternity without those I love? Now, listen, this will, this is, this, I hope this is the hardest question I get tonight, because it's hard. <laughs> I, hope, I hope there's no more coming this, this is hard. Um, and actually, I, I want you to know that I, before I start to act like I, I have a good answer, uh, in, in an individualistic society like ours in Europe, and actually, America is more individualistic than you. Uh, Canada, it's really, it, it starts with America, then it gets a little bit better in Canada, and Australia gets a little bit... You, know, or it, you are still a little bit more, you're more willing to stand in line, for example, in a queue here. <laughs> Whereas British people stand in a queue, you know, which already shows you've got a little bit more of a collective mindset. Americans aren't going to do that, they're just going to figure out their way in. And the more individualistic the society, the more this is not a problem. You say, well, I've got to decide, I've got to get it right, and who knows what else is happening. But I'll, uh, in cultures in which your family is extremely important and your ancestors are very important, this is a real problem. I understand that. All I can say is, uh, you know, C.S. Lewis tries to get at it a little bit in The Great Divorce. I won't even go into it. He's actually wrestling with it. Uh, you were made for Jesus and you were made for God. That's going to fill up your joy sensors. And uh, I don't believe that if somebody else in your family, even, even now we talk about this, if somebody else that you love has decided that they are going to reject God, that shouldn't blackmail you for all eternity. That shouldn't be a cloud over your joy for all eternity. It doesn't seem fair. I mean, even now I know in families, uh, very often there's a, you have a couple parents uh, or you have children and uh, or you have spouses or ex-spouses, and very often because of somebody's behavior uh, and a person that you love, there's always a cloud. You're always walking around through life with a cloud. Uh, Kathy knows, uh, is it Charlie Drew's mother? Charlie Drew's mother-in-law said, once you become a parent for the rest of your life, you're only as happy as your unhappiest child. Think about that. Isn't that awful? I know some of you are saying, oh, okay, no children. <laughs> it's really true. In other words, you can you never you can never untie. So if your child is rebellious or getting or doing stupid things or running off in crazy directions and ruining their life, they say, It's my life, Dad, it's my life, Mom. You shouldn't worry about it. It's my life, I can do what I want. But it's not. And you know, you're you're still tied and it's really hard. Uh, I don't believe that somehow God is going to let that continue to happen. It doesn't seem right, it does not seem fair. So I don't think we need to say somehow God can't fix that or, the, or, or that kind of blackmail will continue. Uh, people who do those things in their lives, in, in our life right now, those people always create some sadness in us. But I don't believe that they're going to be able to do that through all eternity. I don't believe in sin. <coughs> Not in the traditional sense. Convince me if you can. Yeah. By the way, there was a, there was a pastor named uh, Harry Ironsides that was talking to a guy who said, Pastor Ironsides, I do not believe in sin. Now, Ironsides, by the way, was bigger than me and heavier than me. And he says, really? And he lifted up his foot and he came down like this on the man's toe. And the man uh, almost immediately gave evidence of sin. <laughs> so, uh, uh, whoever asked the question, just meet me here after. <laughs> No, maybe you don't want to. I would, hey, listen, I, what I was, I tried to do this on uh, Wednesday night. It was a, it was talking about the subject of sin. Uh, forgive me if this sounds like I'm doing a little bit of an end run. Uh, I gave a whole 30 minutes and then plus an epilogue on it, and you might want to look at that. But what I tried to say that night is if you, if I, generally speaking, in, in Manhattan, with people a lot like you, they say, I don't believe in sin, convince me, uh, in the traditional sense. I say, well, it depends what you mean by the traditional sense. The Bible has two kinds of definitions of sin. They're, they're not contradictory, but they're supplemental. One is sin is transgression of the law. That is, you mustn't lie, you mustn't kill, you mustn't steal, Ten Commandments. And uh, sometimes people say, well, you know, what, what, I think the moral standards are relative. 
And so sometimes I end up saying, all right, let me go to the other definition. Anything you love and center your life on more than God is an idol. I don't think I use the term idolatry on Wednesday night. But what I was trying to say is, according to the Bible, which is the first of the commandments, the first of the commandments is, I am the Lord thy God, have no other gods before me. Did you hear that? It didn't say, worship me, worship other things, or worship nothing. It just says, worship me rather than other things. There's no possibility of you not worshiping something. There's no possibility of you not building your life around something. And if whatever that thing is, is not God, a real God, if it's a career or something else, it will drive you into the ground. It will, uh, you may think you're an honest person, but if, you, if the main thing in your life is your family, if the main thing in your life is some political cause, if the main thing in your life is your career or making money, if it's something that's not God, you will, in the end, break the law. You, it will drive you, it will frighten you, if you start to fail at it, it'll destroy your ability to love yourself. You know, it'll fill you with self-loathing. Uh, if, if, if it's threatened, you might embezzle, you might cheat, you might lie. Uh, so the other approach to do sin is to say, well, the Bible talks about sin as anything that's more important to you than God. And I've never had anybody, actually, that I sat down and spoken to about this that didn't say, that's interesting. That's pretty interesting. So in other words, there we don't have to argue about the moral standards. Do you, if you don't believe in God, you're going to put something in the place of God, and you're going to have a lot of trouble not essentially having your whole life revolve around that. And in the long run, it's going to lead to breakdown. That's what the Bible says. So that's also traditional, even though usually when you hear ministers or Christians talk about sin, they just strictly talk about the law. Uh, put it this way. Sin is not just doing bad things. According to the Bible, sin is turning good things into ultimate things. Family is a good thing. Career is a good thing. So if you think sin is only doing bad things, broaden your understanding. Sin is also turning good things into ultimate things. That will lead to breakdown, and it will lead you to doing bad things. And when you think about what the Bible says about sin, it's very comprehensive, it's very deep, it's very profound. I think it has great explanatory power. And I hope what I just said is convincing, but you might want to look at, listen to the whole uh, talk on Wednesday night. Thanks, Tim. We've probably got time for one more question. You said the other night, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, how do I do that? Um, I was going to get to that in the epilogue. Should we take one last question? Then we'll have to switch it around the order. We got another one? Seems like comes. I, well, we could go out on that. Mm -hmm. I see somebody. <laughs> you know, your misspellings will be in front of everybody in Oxford. <laughs> right. If you misspell, Oxford University will know. Great. We'll spend about four minutes on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Why can one not be just indifferent to the existence of God? Well, take it up with... I didn't say it. He said it. It's... Uh, <laughs> Um, I think, I don't know how you can be indifferent. Why can one not be just indifferent to the existence of God? If you define the existence of God, um, if you think of God as just an impersonal force of some sort, Thomas Nagel, I think, is right in saying that, that uh, he, he probably is, and I think this is, a, this is a fair comeback. When Thomas Nagel says, I don't want there to be a God, you know, Aldous Huxley said something about that, too. Uh, he said, I didn't want there to be a God because I wanted to live my life the way I wanted to. Now, you can actually decide, I believe in God, but I believe in a God that actually is an impersonal God that's a, sort of a force of love or cosmic life and, 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 and has no particular... That, that God has no particular bearing on my choices. But I think what Thomas Nagel is trying to say is that the God of the Bible you can't be indifferent to. Uh, the traditional God you cannot be indifferent to. Because you will, in a sense, lose control of your life and won't be able to live the way you want to. And therefore, nobody is really indifferent or objective. That's, I think that's probably what he meant. Thanks, Tim. Really sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, please keep asking. There's a couple of ways immediately after the talk that you can do that. Tim and his wife, Kathy, will be down at the front here, so do come and speak to those. 
And also, right at the back in the corner, there's a question point with a bunch of guys who'd be happy to talk things through with you as well. I'm going to hand over to Tim now for a bit of a conclusion. Sure. Um, there's two last words I'd like you to consider that are in the text we listened to, or we read tonight. One is brothers. Jesus says to his disciple, to, to Mary, go tell my brothers. You notice he doesn't say, go tell those miserable deserters. And why didn't he? I mean, the last time Jesus saw them, he only saw the back of their heads, the tail. They were running. They denied him. They betrayed him. They fled. You know, they all abandoned him. He saw them at their worst, and now he calls them brothers. Uh, there's a story <coughs> about the czar. I don't even know which of the Russian czars, but the story of a czar who had a, uh, a, a, a beloved officer in his army who was dying of some terminal disease, and uh, the czar said, you have been a faithful uh, servant of mine, what can I do for you? And the czar, uh, the, the man said, I have a son, a young son, and he will be without parents, and would you look after him? And the czar promised to do that, and the man died, and the czar brought the boy into the palace and raised him, and, uh, and gave him an education. And eventually he went off to military school, and he got commissioned, and he became an officer in the Russian army. But he had a gambling problem. And uh, because of his gambling problem, he began to go into debt. And because of the debt, he began to embezzle because he had a, 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 a position in the, his particular regiment in which he had access to the money of the, the funds, and he began to embezzle in order to make good his debts, but he had to do more and more and more. And finally, one night, he realized the jig was up, that he was going to be found out, that it wouldn't be long before, maybe within hours, that people would discover, the auditors would discover what was happening. So he sat down over the books, realized that it was up, that the end was near, and he was drinking and drinking and drinking because he knew he had to kill himself. And he was trying to get up the nerve, and he had the gun, but he drank a little bit too much to give himself nerve, and he passed out. <laughs> now the czar, that particular czar, had a, uh, a habit, he had a practice in which he would dress up as an enlisted man. So no one knew he was a czar. He would dress up in, the, uh, in a big coat and, and in the uh, uniform of an enlisted man, and he would walk about inside his troops to see what the morale was like, and to see what people were saying. And it's actually a pretty good little bit of leadership wisdom. But he came into the tent where his foster son had passed out. And he walks over and he sees the books and he figures it out and he sees the gun and he knows what was going on. And later the young man wakes up and there in front of him is a sealed letter that says, I will make good the debt. And the seal of the czar is on it. I will make good the debt, the czar. Jesus Christ, as God, come as an enlisted man. He came into this world. He looked into your heart. He looked into my heart. He looked into the disciples' heart. And he saw darkness. He saw self-centeredness. He saw anxiety, fearfulness. He just, he saw, he saw all of the, of the uh, he saw a mess. And he still loved us. He made good the dead. He doesn't call us deserters. He calls us brothers. He calls us sisters. Isn't that amazing? The other word I want you to see is the word Mary. I, I don't even know quite what to tell you about this. I've always, all my life, I have been moved by the way that Jesus didn't say, hey, look, it's me, or I don't know what he would have said. <laughs> Instead, in order to get through to her, he said, Mary. Mary. He knows her. He names her. And
And actually, in the end, that's one of the main reasons, the main bits of evidence that Christianity is true. When you first give yourself to Christ, when you first take that step of faith, when you first make that commitment, there's almost, there's got to be, there has to be doubts. You can't, you can't, there's never enough evidence to completely, absolutely prove actually anything. We talked about that before. You can't prove anything. Uh, and when you first get in there, you know that you've got selfish motives and you know you've still got doubts. But as time goes on, he will name you. He will show you he knows who you are. And you will find that you didn't know who you were until he named you, as it were. Until it's in relationship with him that you will come to know yourself. Mary. Annie Dillard, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning American author, she wrote Tink Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, a terrific book. Annie Dillard, in one place, wrote this. I'd been my whole life a bell, but I never knew it until I was lifted up and wrong. Let Jesus Christ lift you up and ring you, show you who you are, show you what you were made for. Now, let me just close in prayer this way. I said this last night. Sometimes people say, what does it mean to say you believe on him and you receive him? I would still say ABC. Admit your need that you need a savior. There's a lot of ways to get to that place. We've talked about them. There's idolatry. There's some particular sin. I don't know. It's, it's, it's trying to find the water of life in, in, in men or women or career. You admit you need a, a Savior. You say that. You believe that Jesus Christ has died for you and that you start to rely on what he has done rather than on your moral efforts for a relationship with God and then you commit yourself to him. A, B, C. We talked about that last night. If you are willing to pray a prayer I'm about to pray, if you want to pray that prayer with me, you can check the second box on that card uh, when our host comes up to tell you how to use the card. Let's close in prayer. Pray with me. Our Father, we do admit our need for a Savior. Uh, we have tried to be our own saviors. We've tried to be our own masters. It has not worked. We have done wrong, and we need forgiveness. Uh, we've built our lives on other things, and we need to be reoriented. We need a Savior. We admit our need. We turn away from that life and all that. Secondly, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in what he did on the cross. He died and rose for us. And begin right now relying on what he did for relationship with you. And fathers, lastly, we commit ourselves to you. And we thank you for a finished work that Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. And we say, show us now how to live for you. We admit, we believe, we commit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.